Not long after a powerful earthquake struck San Francisco in 1989, a very strange thing happened at Pier 39. It is Tuesday. Absolutely. The first day of spring, as Spencer mentioned, but, but yeah. we all know the first day of spring arrived really yesterday. <laughs> Since February, several hundred have gradually taken over K Dock at the Pier 39 Amusement Center. Why are they here? How long will they stay? As Don Smith of the Marine Mammal Center admits, no one really knows. Wow, this is crazy. What are all these seals doing out here? Actually, these are not seals, they're sea lions. And no one really knows for sure why they chose K Dock to haul out. But we do know that before they came here to K Dock inside the bay, the main local hangout was Seal Rock near the Cliff House on the coast. We also know that great white sharks are predators of sea lions and are known to hunt in the waters around Seal Rock. So the sea lions may have moved to Pier 39 for safety, or maybe they just discovered a better place to rest from the storms and rough waves of the Pacific Ocean shoreline. Whatever the reason, the continued presence of the sea lions at Kadok is a great example of humans and wildlife coexisting in a mutually beneficial manner. Lions anyway. Seals, walruses, and sea lions are all members of a special group of marine animals known as pinnipeds. But these are sea lions and are different than seals because they can move on land by walking on all four flippers. True seals can't do this. And unlike seals, they also have small external ear flaps. Also, sea lions mainly use the strength of their front flippers to cut and turn through the water. True seals depend more on their rear flippers and body for swimming. California sea lions range along the Pacific coast from Vancouver Island in British Columbia all the way down to the southern tip of Baja California in Mexico. But they breed mainly on a few offshore islands like California's Channel Islands off the coast of Los Angeles and Santa Barbara. California sea lions are known for their intelligence, playfulness, and noisy barking. Their colors range from chocolate brown in males to a lighter golden brown in females. Sea lion pups weigh between 13 and 20 pounds at birth and are about 30 inches in length. And they grow up fast. In just four or five years, females can grow to 300 pounds and six feet in length. But the males are even bigger with the mature bulls reaching 850 pounds and over seven feet in length. California sea lions are fast, opportunistic eaters, feeding on herring, rockfish, salmon, octopus, squid, and even small sharks. At the Marine Mammal Center in Marin County, hundreds of rescued sea lions are cared for and nursed back to health every year. Their patients come in with all kinds of injuries, but one of the biggest dangers to sea lions is becoming entangled in plastic pollution. Other threats include malnutrition, illness, and other wounds. The good news is that under the care of many dedicated staff members and volunteers, most of the sea lions that come to the Marine Mammal Center can be rehabilitated and eventually returned home to the sea. Lots of things we can do to help sea lions live happy, healthy lives, but that starts by protecting our undersea environment from pollution. There are lots of ways that you can help the environment by reducing the chemicals and toxins we use on lawns and gardens, by switching to reusable shopping bags and water bottles, and by properly disposing of plastic and other trash items. You can also help by volunteering and just sharing this information with your friends and family. Taking these steps will go a long way toward reducing pollution and helping the marine environment. Our friends the sea lions will be very glad you did. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.
to sing a tribute to the great white shark. We do! I really like spontaneous songs. Living out here, the breeze is breezy, the water is wet, and the fishing is easy for our favorite dishes. For our favorite dishes. Yuck the pie and the fishes. Yuck the pie and the fishes. We're all linked together in the food chain of life with the plants at the bottom up to the great white with its great big jaw. With its great big jaw. That deserve applause. That deserve Sing your praises to the great white shark. Lift your faces for the great white shark. The great white makes our food chain complete so we can all have enough food to eat. Oh, seals and sea lions hate to be but if it ever happens, at least we know the reason We're made of blubber We're made of blubber And the sharks are blubber lovers And the sharks are blubber lovers Every living thing is important in the ocean To keep it in balance is a complicated potion We need each link We need each link Or the chain will sink Or the chain will sink That's why we need the gray Sing your praises to the great white shark. Lift your faces for the great white shark. This bro studios. The open plains of the asphalt jungle, home to many creatures great and small, and the popping ground for one of the most clever and illustrious creatures, the plastic bag. Today we explore the cycle of life for this curious creature, the plastic bag, on its migration to its home, the Pacific Ocean. Once released into the wild, the plastic bag is unsure of itself. It falters at first, but soon, with some help from the wind, the bag will be airborne. This flight will be the first in its long journey towards its final destination, the garbage patch in the heart of the Pacific Ocean. Using the wind to guide it, the plastic bag moves across the city through the air. A city park. This park may at first seem an idyllic place for the plastic bag, but danger lurks round every corner. Here it will encounter many enemies, including one of the most dangerous, park services. Poor little fellow. Looks like his journey ends here. Meanwhile, our little bag has encountered one of nature's most deadly killers the teacup Yorkie. Once the Yorkie has locked onto its victim, there's very little hope of survival. But using its superior size and deft maneuvering, our bag manages to escape the Yorkie's talons and flee for its life. Over the course of its miraculous migration, the plastic bag will cover vast distances through neighborhoods, across parks, and down city streets. It is now nightfall, and our highly advanced night vision cameras have managed to capture for the first time in history a plastic bag in pitch black. Phenomenal. The 
vast cement rivers of California, home to literally dozens of animals. Many plastic bags will not make it out of here. The reeds and branches will see to that. As at home in water as it is on land or in the air, the bag's natural buoyancy makes it an excellent swimmer. It's close now, and it can feel it. At last, the bag has reached the gateway to the open sea. Careful to avoid the mouths of hungry sea life that feed on the helpless plastic, the bag will travel hundreds of miles to join the thriving community of plastic known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The Garbage Patch is a veritable plastic oasis where millions of tons of plastic garbage remain trapped by the currents. It is said to be twice the size of Texas. Never actually biodegrading, here the plastic bag can live indefinitely, peacefully coexisting with billions of other petroleum species before breaking into ever tinier plastic pieces, thus completing the plastic cycle of life. I've been surfing the California coast for 30 years now. Seeing the impact of trash and lost gear on the fish and marine mammals is heartbreaking. Today, Ocean Beach is one of the cleanest beaches I know. When others see me picking up trash, they're usually inclined to do the same, or at least pack out what they pack in. Removing even small pieces of netting saves marine mammals and I know these small gestures can make a big difference. To tell you the truth, there isn't much I don't like about it. I like being on the ocean. I like uh, just being around a couple people working, not in an office. My name is Craig Goucher. I am a commercial crab fisherman at Trinidad. Have been here for a little more than 30 years. This is kind of like my home, I guess. So I have 500 traps. It takes me 10 loads to get those traps out. We set the gear, we set the 10 different loads, we set them all in different places. Because we're searching for where the main population of crabs is. We've been trying to improve on the collection of gear after the season has closed. Because there's always gear that gets lost. This is a picture of a big storm we had approximately 20 years ago in Trinidad. And maybe by looking at it, you can understand better why crab pots do move around and why they're not in position when we go back out to run the crab gear after the storm has subsided. This is one of the main factors why gear gets scattered around the ocean and it is basically lost for a while. And uh, that's what this project is about. I was approached by a person from Sea Dock Society to get this project underway to collect stray gear after the season is closed so that we can basically clean the ocean up when we're done working. Today we'll be, I think we will find some that are stuck and we'll need to pump. We have a, a pump mounted on the boat just for this operation. So that when we can't get one up, we can send the nozzle down and there's a lot of water that goes down the nozzle and it blows the sand away from the crab pot so we're able to retrieve it. Well, it's to our advantage. 
I mean, it's not just a responsibility, it's, it benefits us if we can maintain a healthy, healthy environment. This project is making a healthier ocean by removing all those lost crab pots from the ocean. And, and eventually, what we hope is that all the crab pots that are recovered are what pays for the retrieval through reimbursement from the fishermen who own the gear. They're getting their pot that's worth $200 back for $75 and they might be able to fish that pot for three, four, or five more seasons. The fishermen are actually funding the retrieval program so that they can fund the program in future years. But ultimately, they're going to take this over and this is going to be their program. We want to minimize impacts to wildlife. Um, there's entanglement hazards. Ghost fishing can be an issue. We actually think with this project, we can clean the ocean from, it's about a 22 mile stretch from Redwood Creek to Mad River. With the help of sport fishermen, they locate them for us and give us the numbers. We'll go out in the morning with a whole bunch of numbers, GPS numbers, that we can just go right to these pots and pick them up. It'll be very efficient. By the end of this month, Trinidad's gonna be clean. We typically have between 500 and 1,000 people come through our door every day, which translates to roughly one to two tons of fish that we purchase uh, every week. Every morning, uh, first thing that happens is uh, the fishmongers come, come through this door and bring us in the, the freshest fish available. Fish do, in fact, have seasons, uh, just like, just like produce so. does. Uh, as we're approaching those seasons, we'll have a conversation with the fishmongers and they'll say, you know, we're expecting uh, the West Coast uh, Pacific albacore season to be starting soon. Buying fish seasonally is sustainable uh, for two reasons. One, uh, the method of catch, and that the patterns that, that fish travel di dictates what the best method is for catching them. Our process for purchasing sustainable seafood uh, starts with a conversation. Once that happens, I've had that conversation with the fishmongers, then I turn around and have the conversation with the chefs. Uh, one hook, one line equals one fish, and that's what we're looking for. The albacore tuna that we got in today was line caught. As the currents change in the summer, it, it becomes more available to us. Uh, during the summertime, the fish have come closer to the shore and uh, they can be caught with a hook and line, um, has less bycatch and is a, a sustainable method. Uh, other times of the year, they are around, but they're much further away. And so they, they'll trawl for them and do quite a bit of destruction, uh, both in terms of the environment and the bycatch. From an environmental standpoint, obviously, you know, we, we do this because we care deeply for, uh, for the bays and for the oceans and, and the habitats from where the seafood's coming from. Um, but, you know, as well from a business standpoint, if, uh, if you're taking more than your fair share of any, any fish, then uh, you're not going to be in business much longer when there's no fish to be sold. When an average customer comes into a seafood restaurant, they should be prepared to ask a few questions about where their seafood's coming from. Ask how it was caught, where it was caught. If the server doesn't know, they should check in with the chef. And if the chef doesn't know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's an irresponsible fish, but it might be a good impetus for the chef and the servers and maybe that customer to seek out additional information and learn a little bit more. Personally and professionally, I think that if we uh, make smarter decisions that are beyond just what we want at that exact moment, but what is going to be good for the long run, then everybody benefits.